Hey, Embrace, uh, it's so good to be with you uh, today. If you don't know who I am, my name is Travis. I'm just one of the pastors here at Embrace, and we are excited that you're joining us at one of our campuses, if you're joining us online, or one of our network churches, uh, like always. We're just so, feel so privileged that you would come and worship with us today. Uh, we have been in a series over this Easter called A Timeline, where we've been looking at the events that have happened Uh, the week of Easter, from Palm Sunday all the way up through Thursday, Good Friday, and then leading up to Easter. We've been talking about how this is a week that truly changed the world, but more than that, uh, we hope it's a week that changes our lives as well. Uh, But what you maybe don't know is that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't immediately just go up into heaven. He actually stayed around on the earth for like 40 days, and he just talked with his disciples, he taught them, and he showed up a bunch of ways. And so what we're going to look at today is that 40 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, and we're specifically going to look at three events, three events in what they mean for us. Uh, But before we get into that, uh, I had a memory come back to me Uh, this week. I remember when I was a kid and summer vacation would happen. And I love summer vacation. My guess is almost every kid in the world loves summer vacation. But I remember waking up for summer vacation and just being so excited that school was over. Like boring school is done. And now my, my life is open, right? Like no agenda. I can do whatever I want. I can hang out with friends. I can play duck hunt. Yes, I am that old, the duck hunt. This is, duck hunt was a thing back then. Play, shoot hoops. I can do whatever I want. The day has unlimited potential. It is summer vacation. Now, that was true in theory. In actuality, this is what would happen. I would wake up on a, uh, a summer morning, and I would come down the stairs, and I would open the door into the kitchen, and I would look over on the table, and on that table would be a little white note. Moms, you know where I'm going with this? A little white note. And I would see that note, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I got plans to do nothing today. You pick up that note. Well, here's the deal. My mom would wake up every single morning, every single morning, and before she would go to work, she would write like a thousand things on a list that I would need to get done before she got home. Everything from cleaning the bathroom to burning the trash. Any country kids here that still burn their trash? That was actually fun. I love burning the trash. <laughs> to, to, to vacuuming, to dusting. I still hate dusting to this day. I, I hated that note. Just, just, for, just for, how many of you received one of these notes as a kid? How many of you are a kid and you're still, you're receiving these notes to this day? <laughs> yep. Maybe they're text messages now instead of little white, white notes. I hated these things. But here's the deal. My mom knew she was going to be gone for the day, so she had some things she wanted me to do. My mom was going to be leaving, she was going to be gone, and she had some things for me to do. Now, when we look at these 40 days, uh, these 40 days after Jesus is raised from the dead, this is the same thing that is happening. Jesus realizes, I'm only going to be with you for a little while, So I have some things that you need to do. I have some instructions for you to do. And this is not like my boring mom's task list. These are important things. These are things that will change the world. Now, this is so important for us. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus this morning, Like if you have seen Jesus, if you try to dedicate your life to him, you're trying to walk in his ways, one of the most important questions that you can ask is, what does Jesus want me to do? Like if Jesus was to lay out a little slip of white paper on the kitchen table every single morning for you, what would it have on it? Now, this is what's so exciting about this last 40 days, because in this 40 days, Jesus tells his disciples exactly what he wants them to do. He gives them a set of instructions. So let's hop in. Let's hop into our timeline. And we're going to look first at one of the first post-Easter appearances uh, to Jesus. 
Uh, They are going up into Galilee, and they're on a mountain, and this is what happens. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. They were previously in Jerusalem, and they went back to Galilee. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. Okay, so Jesus has been raised from the dead. He knows he's got a limited time with the disciples. And so the first thing he tells them to do is make disciples. Make disciples. Now, this is a word that we do not use very often outside of church. So if this is one of your very first times, you're like, I've never heard that word before. Don't worry. This is like a churchy, churchy word. But what it means is very simple. And Jesus actually gives us the definition in this passage. This is what discipleship means. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you to do. So Jesus is saying, I have, I have, I have, Something I need you to do. I'm going to be going away, and I want to make this really simple for us this morning. What does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to teach others what we've been taught. Really simple. My hope with all three of these points is you can put these in practice this week. Teach others what we've been taught. Um, we're, we're ending, we're nearing the end of March Madness. Uh, Coming up, we got the women's game this afternoon. Iowa fans, stop it, stop it. Don't care, don't care. You Iowa people, you think you're so special. Um, But my son Paxton, he loves sports. Like he loves talking about sports. He loves reading about sports. He loves playing about sports, playing sports. He just, everything about sports he loves. And so I decided this year, I'm like, I'm going to introduce him to the word of, world of bracketology, right? And so I sit down and I start helping him fill out his first bracket. And I realize when I start, he knows nothing about it. He like knows nothing about filling out a bracket. He doesn't know what a tournament even is. Like, so I have to teach him what a tournament is. He doesn't understand the seeds. And so I'm like, this is a one seed. This is a 16 seed. And then we're talking about the different regions. Why are there four one seeds? So I had to kind of explain all that to him. And that night we we finished his bracket and I I put him down for bed and he looked to me and he said, dad, what happens if I get them all right? (laughs) And I said to him, I said, I think you win like a million dollars or something. And then he looks back at me with this smile and the biggest eyes, he's like, do you think I can do it? I just didn't have the heart. He went to bed that night thinking he could win a million dollars, okay? Like, I didn't have the heart to tell him he couldn't do it. But what was I doing? I was simply teaching Paxton what I had taught, what I had been taught. I was discipling him in March Madness, which isn't the greatest thing in the world to disciple someone in, but I was teaching him what I had been taught. This is what Jesus wants you and I to do. Now, if you're anything like me, I was raised in the church, I was raised around ministries, and there was like 7,000 different discipleship programs that you can be a part of, and none of them are bad. It's just simpler than that. It's simpler than that. Jesus, simple directions. Teach what I taught. Teach what you've been taught. So what does this look like for us? How could you implement this this week? So, This is a simple way. So when you come to church on Sundays, you hear a message. And when you hear that message, the first thing that you should do is you should implement that in your life. But the second thing you should do is teach what you've been taught. You hear a truth on Sunday, tell it to your kids, tell it to your family, tell it to your neighbor, tell it to your coworker. You don't got to be super demand, like over the top, crazy Christian. Just teach what you've been taught. Uh, Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, I know most of you are there because it was just packed everywhere, right? 
Adam shared with us that we often go to dead places to find life. Does anyone remember that? We often go to dead places to find life. We go to the bar, we go to relationships, we go to our finances to find life, but life should be found in Jesus. We all learn that. Teach it to somebody. Teach what you have been taught. Jesus, he's only going to be on the earth a little bit longer. And the first thing he wants us to do, the first thing he wants his disciples to do is to teach what we've been taught. So let's continue on to the second event on our timeline in this next 40 days. I'll I'll give you a little backstory here. Uh, The disciples are still in Galilee. They're on the Sea of Galilee and they are fishing. And they can't catch any fish when all of a sudden this man on the shore says, why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? So they do, and all of a sudden they catch a ton of fish. And in that moment, they realize who this man is. It's Jesus. And so Peter, he jumps out of the boat and he starts swimming to shore. The rest of them aren't as crazy, so they just kind of take the boat uh, to the shore. And there on the beach, they eat a meal with Jesus. After the meal is over, Peter and Jesus, they walk along the beach together. If you remember, Peter denied Jesus three times, and so they have some business to attend to. But listen to the conversation that they have. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So this might be a little confusing for us, but just remember Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has a little bit of time with the disciples. And so he is giving some instructions to Peter. He's telling him what I need you to do. And what does he need him to do? To take care of his sheep. Now, Jesus often uses the metaphor of sheep to describe us in the Bible. And this is not a flattering metaphor. Like sheep are... They're not very smart. Uh, They need a lot of tending to. You have to care for sheep. You need to help sheep. And Jesus is saying to Peter, you saw me every step of the way. You saw how I cared for the needs of the people, how I loved them, how I listened to them, how I fed them, how I healed them. You saw what I did for the sheep. I need you to do the same. You need to take care of the sheep. Now, this might be obvious, but care and teaching are two different things. Teaching is great, right? It's great to have wisdom and knowledge and instruction. That's all great, but we all know that we oftentimes need more than teaching. Sometimes we need someone to love us. Sometimes we need someone to walk alongside of us. So how do we do this? Jesus tells us to care the sheep, but what does this look like practically? Once again, trying to keep this so simple for us, so simple that we could impact, so we could do this this week. This is what he wants. Find a need and fill a need. This is how you care for the sheep. You find a need and you fill a need. If someone loses a loved one, that's a need. Fill it by making them a meal, being there for them. If someone is struggling with depression, that's a need. Fill it. Meet with them. Talk with them. Pray with them. Help them find a Christian therapist. If someone loses their job, that's a need. Fill it. Help them on the job hunt. Maybe pay for one of their bills to help them get through to the end of the month. Find a need, fill a need. And I just have to say this, this is not the job of pastors. This is not the job of the church. This is our job. 
As followers of Jesus, this is our job. And you don't do this for everybody. That would be overwhelming because there's so many needs, but you can do it for one. You can maybe do it for two people. Find a need and fill a need. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I'm not good at this. I like to teach. I don't necessarily like to tend to the sheep. I don't like to find a need and fill a need, which is just the worst thing for your pastor to say. It's like, it's like saying the barista can't make a latte. You're like, then you shouldn't be a barista probably, right? Uh, but I want to tell you something that happened to me uh, about a month ago. I had a good friend of mine, and she reached out to me, and she was having a really difficult time with a family member. There's just a situation that happened in her family, and it was really difficult. And so we talked, we prayed together, and then I kind of sent her on her way. And I didn't say anything to her since then. Like, I just kind of assumed that she was okay. Well, weeks went by, and she reached out back to me and said, hey, I'm not upset, but I'm still hurting. I wish you would have reached out to me. What she was saying is like, and she's not overbearing at all. She was just saying like, hey, I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I just need someone to walk alongside me during this time. I'm not good at that, but it doesn't matter if I'm good at it or not. These are the instructions that Jesus has given Peter, and these are the instructions that he's given us. Care for the sheep. Find a need. Fill a need. Last. This is on our timeline of 40 days, and this is exciting because this is the last moment that Jesus is with his disciples. Like after this, he's going to ascend into heaven. This is the last thing that he says to the disciples. On one occasion, while he was eating with the disciples, they're back in Jerusalem at this time, he said to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus, he's been raised from the dead. This is the last thing he says to them. This is the last thing I need you to do. You need to be my witnesses. You need to be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, which is where they were, but to the ends of the world. Now, we all know what this word witness means. We listen to too much true crime podcasts and Netflix documentaries to not know what this is anymore, right? A witness is someone that, that sees an event happen, typically a crime, and then they go into the courtroom and all they do is they share what they have seen. That's all they do. They're not defending anyone. They share what they have seen. Jesus, the last thing he wants you to do is he wants you to share what you have seen. Now, this is different than teaching. This is different than providing for a need. This is just sharing what Jesus has done in your life. You don't have to have a PhD in theology. You don't have to know a whole bunch of Bible verses. You just have to know what he did in your life. And you share what you have seen. I have this um, men's group that I'm a part of on Wednesday nights, and it is awesome. It's, a, it's some of the most random dudes. If you saw us in your group, you're like, how do they get along? It's great. We love each other, and we hang out, and it's just an awesome time. Uh, but our, our group leader, his name's Chris, he will often ask us to share our stories to the group. And you can imagine how well this goes over with a bunch of men. You know, it's like we ask and the guys are like, ah, I don't like feelings. I don't like thinking about anything that's happened past two minutes ago. And inevitably, every one of the guys will say, 
and I don't have a story. And then they share, and they just blow your world out. It's like, you don't have a story? Are you serious? I want to share some of the stories that I've heard in this group. One guy shared about how he started reading the Bible for the first time, and literally he said the words started glowing on the page. It was like they were speaking to him. Another guy, he talked about the night he was saved, and he said it was like supernatural wisdom came down. He said, I don't know what it was, but for the first time in my life, I knew the difference between right and wrong. Another guy, he shared about the crazy circumstances that him and his wife had to go through in order for them to adopt their children. And lastly, this one guy, he shared about getting sober and he wasn't really a believer as he got sober and he thought he did it all by himself. And now as he looks back, he's like, it's crazy. I see God in every single step of me and my sobriety. When Jesus asks us to be witnesses, this is what he's talking about. Just share what you have seen. You do not have to regurgitate any Bible verses. Because if you're like me, you're going to forget them on the spot, right? You just have to tell what Jesus has done in your life. Now, I know there are so many of you here today that are saying, I do not have a story. If you follow Jesus, I promise you, you have a story. You just have not thought about it. You have not taken any time to think about it. You have not looked back at your life and started to see the fingerprints of God in your life. And so this is what I want to invite you to do today, not tomorrow, today, to find 10 minutes and just to think about what Jesus did in your life. Just to go back. Just think about how Jesus moved in your life. And then I want you to write it down and remember it. And next time you get the opportunity, Be his witness. Share what you have seen. Will some people doubt it? Yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't have to prove anything to them. You say, yeah, sorry, I know it sounds crazy. The guy who saw the glowing words in the Bible, you don't think I didn't doubt that? Yeah, so share, I'm sorry, I saw it. Share what you have seen. Jesus is going away. And the last thing he says to us, the last instruction he has, the last thing he wants us to do is to be his witness, to just share what we have seen. So on this timeline, uh, the 40 days that Jesus was on the earth, he shared three things that he wants us to do. Three instructions. And here they are again. Teach others what you've been taught. Find a need and fill a need and share what you have seen. A few weeks ago, actually, sorry, a couple months ago, I was in, I was, I was in the uh, lobby after I'd getting, gotten done giving a message and this middle school kid comes up to me and he's a little nervous and he's like, hey, I have to talk to you about something. So I've shared my story up here before, but uh, I struggled a lot with doubting the existence of God, that God was real, that he was, that, that, this, was, that, that, that this was all created by God, all that sort of stuff. And so the kid came up to me, he's like, hey, I, I struggle a lot with doubts. I talked to Adam about this, and he told me to talk to you. You know you're in trouble <laughs> if Adam sends you to me. <laughs> and so I said, I said, dude, I'd, I'd love to talk to you. So we got together at a bagel place. We got a bagel. We sat down. And this kid just started sharing with me all of his doubts, all of his questions. And I'm going to tell you, it was comical. Every doubt he had, I was just like, yeah, I had that. Oh, yeah. Every question he had, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I've, I had that question for sure. I, st- I, still, have, I still have that one. It was like I was talking to my middle school self in that moment. But here's the deal. I didn't realize it at the time until I did this message. I didn't realize I did these three things. I shared what I had seen. 
I, I literally told him my story of how I doubted and I prayed this prayer and then I saw Jesus show up in my life. I taught what I'd been taught. Like over the years, I have learned so many things about doubting and this and that and the evidence here. And I just shared that stuff with him. I just taught what I had been taught. And then I found a need and I filled a need. I remember saying over and over to him, I said, you're not crazy. I've, I've had every doubt that you've had. Don't worry. Keep following Jesus. And afterwards, I said, if you ever need to talk again, let me know. And we've stayed in connection ever since then. But here's the reason why I share this story. When I went out, when we left, and I went out to the parking lot, and I sat down in my minivan, I just sat there. And I prayed to God. I said, thank you. That's what I was made for. That's why you put me here on this earth. That's what's important. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do what you want me to do. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he has a few instructions for us, but they're not like our mom's notes on the table. It's good stuff. It's important stuff. It's stuff that will change the world. Do you know what Jesus wants you to do? If Jesus left you a note on the kitchen counter, what would it say? At a minimum, it would say these three things. Teach others what we've been taught. Find a need and fill a need. And share what you've seen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much um, for these 40 days and the instructions that you give us. Uh, You know, God, as I am reading through this, I do not do these perfectly at at, at all. Uh, Not great at caring for your sheep at times. Not great at the witnessing part, Lord. And I know everyone here too probably feels the same. Hopefully, God, We've simplified it today so that everybody can walk out and start doing what you called them to do. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everyone, it's Adam from Embrace. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to Embrace's YouTube channel to stay updated. You can also click here to check out other videos. Thanks for watching.